So we've got the Hayatia 2019 um, Year 10 physics paper for double award. Your formula sheet as usual. And we start off with not a very nice question, in my opinion. It takes a lot of time because it's a lot of numeracy going on. Um, your first question for three marks needs three ticks. But there's a lot um, going on. So we'll work through this. This will probably take the most time to do. Television 1 uses less energy per second than Television 2. So it's about recognizing uh, less energy per second. So a joules per second is the same as a watt. So we're looking at uh, 1 and 2, and we can see that uh, 32 watts compared to 78 watts. So that's your first one correct. Now, we're looking for three ticks on here uh, because it's worth three marks. So let's read through the largest television always uses the most energy. That's not true because you'll see that you've got, um, so there's the sizes of TVs, so 163 centimeters, 123 centimeters. I think this is the crucial one because it uses 172 there. And then when we compare that to this one, 139 centimeters is less energy. So the statement's uh, false there. The purchase cost of the television uh, two is 1.5. So here's the purchase costs in this table. It's actually the other way where um, TV three is 1.5 times that of two, and they've got it the other way around there. Um, more expensive televisions always use less energy. So again, I would compare television three because that's the most expensive. And then I go down to television two and see if it uses less energy. But um, when you look, that you'll see that the statement's false. Um, television 3 uses 40 units per year uh, less, or oh, sorry, more than Television 4 there. So the way I would do that is to subtract one from the other, and it works out to be 40 units less. So that statement's true. And then televisions with the same energy rate in, for example, A star or A plus, don't always have the same power. So it's trying to trick you there into looking for A plus or A star energy ratings. But we're looking for the energy rating that's got both the same. And you can see that the powers are different. So the statement's true there. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Let me just undo that a second. There we are. So the statement's true because it says it doesn't always have the same power. So a lot of work involved for three marks there, and that can take some time up. So I think the big um, learning, um, the, the experience I take away from this and the key learning from this is don't always um, spend hours and hours on you know, a three mark question. Maybe come back to this if you're getting caught up with the numeracy. Because as you'll see, as we push on, then we've got some quick wins, especially down by here. Again, another numeracy question now. The question is saying that it's proportional to screen size. So what we're going to do is take the screen size and the power rating of TV1, and we're going to see how many times, so how many centimeters per watt are we getting for this? And we're getting 2.16, and then we're going to do the same with TV2. So we've got the screen size over the power, and we're going to come up with 1.78 there. So the claim is not true because the ratios are not the same. Now, there's a couple of ways you could have done this. This, uh, I, I think, is the easiest way to put the wire, how many watts go into the centimeter to get you that centimeters per watt there. But another a numeracy question for three marks that can get you tangled up. Then we come out to the um, using equations now. So uh, it says, suggest the television to is use so, so and the data so, so we're going to use this to calculate the time so the units used from television 2 was 108 and the power was 78 watts uh, we need to convert that to kilowatts because it's in kilowatts there and once we do that we can come up with 100 uh, 1385 hours and then use an equation two now, so that's going to be cost. So this is wrapped up with this equation. If you look at the equation sheet, uh, these two equations come together. So we've got the number of units now, which is 108, and then the price per unit is 16 pence. Um, a fairly simple, for, uh, straightforward uh, calculation there to give you £17.28 or 1,728 pence. But make sure you put it in pounds because that's what they're looking for. 
Again, uh, this is an extremely long question, <clears throat> and the first one. So now, uh, a little bit of numeracy again. Uh, expected lifespan, uh, of, uh, lifespan of a television is 10 years. So Simon concludes that it would be more cost-effective now uh, to get television 2 uh, because it'll work out cheaper. So what we've got to do, I've just worked out the cost of running TV uh, 2 for there. So I can use that £17.28 and times that by 10 years now. That's going to give me £172.80. So, that, so we've done that. I've got to do it for, for TV4 now, though. Now, the units I've got from my first page from there. So the units, 172 units. And then we times that by the 16 pence, the cost. And that comes out to £27.52. Again, times it by 10 years to give you that overall cost. You can see it's way more expensive there. So I've uh, taken one from the other. So TV4 costs £102.40 more uh, to run, but it is £200 cheaper. So um, so Simon is correct. I don't know why I've put Sarah there. It should be Simon is correct. So you can see I've done the calculations. It's £102.40. And then you're always going to get this question, other than to save money, why should we use less energy? Well, less energy equals less fuel. Less fuel equals less CO2 and SO2 pollution. And less pollution means less contribution towards global warming and the greenhouse effect. So two marks there. Often they come up as three marks. So then, uh, nearly seven minutes just on question one, and now we can rip through these uh, questions now. So we got a wave question. So it's all about recognizing now that these uh, wave fronts, there's your boundary. So these wave fronts are going to bend in because it's shallow water, therefore automatically reducing that wavelength. So we've got the equation. It's got five waves in 10 seconds. So that's pretty much your frequency because you want to see how many per second. So if we've got fives in 10, five waves in 10 seconds, then we're going to have 0 0.5 in one second. And then you times that. You're going to have to measure this with your ruler. It comes out to be uh, 1.2 centimeters or 12 millimeters. Don't forget that conversion then back into meters because that's what the answer is in, meters per second. Always look for what the answer is in because that could have been centimeters per second and then no conversion required. State of the frequency wavelength and wave speed wave speed will compare in deep and shallow water so some of this you can get from the diagram but this is main learning that the frequency will be the same in both regions now if the frequency is the same it means if the wavelength is going to be longer then the wave speed has got to be greater to get your same number of waves past each second so the wavelength in the deeper water as we saw is going to be longer therefore the wave speed is greater in deep water on to question three then which is a six marker and it's all about one of the specified practicals where we're measuring the density of a, a regular shaped object um so what you oh yeah so a small pebble not a regular shaped object it says there so the first thing you do is measure the mass of the dry pebble. That's the easy mark, okay? You're going to stick that on a balance to get your, your mass, and then you're going to record that. Then you're going to get a measuring cylinder, and you're going to place a suitable volume of water into that, and you're going to make sure there's enough space for when you drop the pebble in that the water's not going to overflow. So you pick uh, maybe 50, I don't know, 50 centimeters cubed or whatever. Then you're going to record that volume, and then when you put the pebble in, it's going to displace some of that water so they're going to record that new volume to calculate the volume of the pebble you'd simply take the uh, the last volume that you got away from the original original away from the other one actually so the big one so the little one from the big one and then you're going to use your, your density equation then to give you that density so you've got your mass that's the first thing we got we measured our volume by using the displacement of the of the water that you used. And then I've got a couple of little diagrams there. You can see that I've got my volume in there. I've put my pebble on the balance, put my pe pebble in the water, and that, it's gonna make that water rise. And you, you're gonna take this initial one from that one. So if this was 50 centimeters cubed and this was 70 centimeters cubed, then you're gonna take 50 from 70 and the actual volume of the pebble is gonna be 20. That's the easiest way I can describe it there. 
Question four then is on circuits and it's giving you a thermistor, a voltmeter, which is in parallel. Your ammeter is in series and you've got a little switch going on there. So what we've got temperature against and then it's taking some current and voltage readings and you've got resistance. Just to be aware, this resistance now is in uh, kilo ohms and then you've got uh, milliamps there. So just watching out for that. You've got a complete graph of four marks. So you're going to get one mark for your scale. You're going to get two marks for your plot in and then another mark for your curve. So there's the, there's an appropriate scale. There's the plot in all done for you. Describe the relationship of the graph for two marks. A really nice question here. Yeah? I'm going to say as temperature, as the X increases, then Y, which is in this case the resistance in uh, kilo ohms, is going to decrease at a decreasing rate. So that's your two marks. One mark for spot in the trend, and then another mark for saying at that decreasing rate. Uh, Follow-up question then. So now, uh, resistor of resistance 5 kilo uh, ohms is now added to the original circuit. Now they're going to do this in parallel um, at 30 degrees Celsius. The same 12 volt power supply is used. So the resistance at 30 degrees, uh, you can see I've used my graph here, is 8 point, I think. Um, that's not a very good line there. So about 8.4, I think. What have I used there? I've put, yeah, I've used 8.4. Um, and then you've got a 5 uh, is, is now added uh, in parallel. Now, because it's in parallel, I'm going to use this 1 over RT equals 1 over R1. So RT means total resistance. So I've got my uh, 1 over 8.4 plus my 1 over 5. And use the calculator uh, to do this. You're going to come up with 0 0.319. Now, that's not your answer yet because that is what 1 over RT is. R now is going to be the reciprocal of that. So 1 over 0 0.319 is going to give you 3.13 ohms. Now that's giving you ohms, but we're going to pull it now into kilo ohms. Um, so when I do that, that's times 10 to the power 3. So it's going back to the question now. I, which is current, equals my 12 volts over 3 times 1.13 uh, times 10 to the power 3 because it's kilo ohm. And that's going to come out with a current of 3.83 times 10 to the minus 3 amps. So five marks available for that. So that's why uh, there was a bit to do. Kim suggests that the current through both the resistor and the thermistor will decrease as the thermistor cools down. Explain whether or not she is correct. So this is a little bit of theory on uh, recognizing how thermistor works. So resistance through the thermistor will increase as the temperature decreases. And that's the same if you're given a uh, light-dependent resistor as well. As light increases, the resistance is going to decrease. So it's the same relationship. So the current, therefore, will increase through the thermistor. Current through the resistor is unchanged. So she's correct for one, but not for the other. Is your answers there. Okay, nearly there. A couple more pages to go. Uh, question five. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tasty. The first question is, okay, describe how electricity is uh, produced from a uh, fossil fuel power station. So we've got the fuel is burnt to heat water. It's going to make steam. The kinetic energy of the steam is going to drive and rotate the turbine, which is attached to a generator, and that generator is what's going to produce the electricity. Then we're given a Sankey diagram, um, of, of which is a huge numeracy uh, question, because what we've got to recognize, and if you've tried this without watching the video, um, you can get caught up, because I did get caught up on this, is 75% of the input energy is transferred as useful energy. So this and that makes up 75%, and this is going to be 25%. But of this, 40% is this fella here. So you can almost see this now as 40% and 60%. So, if they, so we're looking at 100% of this useful energy is what we're trying to work out. Now, we're told that this is 40%, and we're told that this is 3.2 megawatts. Now, we don't really have to convert uh, from megawatts yet because um, we're just going to, because it's an efficiency question, it should come all out in the wash. So the way I've done that, if I know 40% is that, then I'm going to see what 100% of this is to, to realize how much energy is getting uh, used for useful. Uh, 
And the way to do that, we can say power equals, so it's just a rearrangement of this equation where we say uh, percentage equals useful over total. Now, because I don't know my total, I'm going to say useful equals the, um, sorry, that should be my total equals my useful over percentage there. Now, the reason I'm using useful is because this is the useful energy, and this is where we can get caught up in this question. So it's 3.2 over 40 times 100, and this is going to equal 8 megawatts. Now, that is just this bit. So what do we know now? That 75% is 8 megawatts. So I need to find out what 1% is, and then I'm going to times it by 100 to see what it is. So that's why I've got 8 over 75, and then I'm times it 100. So I found out one, what 1% 1 is by 8 over 75, and then times it by 100, and you're going to get 10.7 megawatts going in. This is your total energy. So the claim is not correct. All right, and that was a tough question. I think looking at... Um, how the country did on this, not very well in total. So this was a really nasty question. But we are on question five of a higher paper. So I think this might be the last question. Now, no, we got one more after this. So uh, this one's a little bit easier. We just got to realize this is megawatts. That's in kilovolts. Once we know this now, and it's stepped up to 400 kilovolts. So which voltage do we use? We're going to use this one. Um, calculate because it's the current in the wires. So it's going to be after it's been stepped up. So my voltage is, um, sorry, my power. I'm going to use power equals I times V. Rearrange that to get your current. So that's going to be P over V. So my power is uh, 1,200 times 10 to the power 6 because it's a megawatt. And then my voltage is a kilovolt, so it's times 10 to the power 3, 400 times 10 to the power 3 there. And that's going to give you, make sure you always look at the unit that they want. This is in amps, so the conversions were required 3,000. Last question then. On satellites, uh, another kind of orbit is geosynchronous, and they've mentioned about geostationary up here. Um, state one similarity and one difference. Well, they both have the same orbit time. So they both go 20, uh, take 24 hours to orbit. Uh, the big uh, difference, though, is that one is above the equator. So if it's above the equator, it's going to stay in the same position all the time. So you can have constant communication. So an object in geostationary orbits above the equator of the Earth. So has the same orbit time as the Earth. Therefore, it's in constant communication. Geosynchronous, because it's not uh, above the uh, equator, it's going to take 24 hours to return to exactly the same point. So it can only communicate every 24 hours. State which satellite is in geostationary uh, orbit. So we're looking for a 24-hour period. So it's got to be three. Then we've got um, a bit of a diagram that we're going to have to do. Um, a signal is sent from base station A uh, to a geostationary satellite. So all these are going to remain in constant orbit there. Uh, and he's got a time delay of 0 0.48 seconds there. An incomplete diagram is shown. So what have we got to do? We've got to use an equation on page 2 to calculate the distance the signal has travelled. And the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the power 8 there. So I'm going to take the time that it told me up here, which is 0 0.48 seconds. And I've got a speed. So to get the distance, we're going to use this distance equals speed times time. So that's 3 times uh, 10 to the power 8 times your 0 0.48, and that's going to give me um, 144 million meters. Or we can say 1.4 times 10 to the power 8 there. Use your answer from this now and information from the table to determine the base station A, B, or C. Finally receive the signal and show all your work ends. So this question is all about recognizing what's going on in the diagram. You can see I've sketched a rough uh, where it goes from A to a satellite to back to B. So that's going to be double the distance there. And then from B to C is going to be by a factor of four and then returning back to A. So you can almost think of this is the distance. We can get the height from the table and then it's going to be that again. So which is why we often either divide by uh, the number of times it's traveled or multiply depending on what the question is saying. In this, uh, in this one, we get the height from the ground station to the satellite and we got that from there from this table. So I know that it travels a distance of 1.4 times 10 to the power 8. So what I'm saying is, how many times does that height go into that distance? And the answer comes out as 4. So it's got to be base station C, 
because if it's four times, it goes once, twice, three times, four times. So uh, for the last question on a higher paper, not too bad. It's just recognizing that you've got to divide one distance into the other distance to see how many distances you've got there. Right, thank you for listening. Hopefully this has been some help. And um, thank you for listening.